Bismillah, Alhamdulillah. Um, peace and blessings of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Assalamu Alaikum Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuh. And thank you for tuning in to this evening's talk on Fitra and the Ramadan Moon, which is the last speaker, um, speaker event of the month. So our speaker today needs no introduction, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway. Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad is currently Professor of Islamic Studies at both Ibrahim College and Cambridge Muslim College, of which he is the Dean. He studied as an undergraduate at Cambridge, then at Al Azhar, and founded the Eco Mosque, which opened to the public in 2019. He's also a lecturer of Islamic Studies at the Faculty of Divinity, and CU ISOC is privileged to have him as our senior treasurer, which I'm sure is a source of insecurity to our fellow ISOCs around the country. Um, quick reminder to please submit any questions you have to the mentee, the code is in the chat and we'll do our best to get to those by the end, uh, or feel free to message one of the Shura. We'll start with a short Quran recitation and then inshallah we'll pass over to Sheikh Abdul Hakim. Jazakallah khair. A'udhu billahi minash rajim. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فأقم وجهك للدين حنيفا فأقم وجهك للدين حنيفا فطرة الله التي فطر الناس عليها فطرة الله التي فطر الناس عليها لا تبديل لخلق الله ذلك الدين القيم ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون منيبين إليه واتقوه وأقيموا الصلاة ولا تكونوا من المشركين الذين فرقوا دينهم وكانوا شيعا كل حزب بما لديهم فرحون Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, welcome everybody. Blood sugar levels may be low, but that's no excuse for uh, deactivating the little grey cells. Um, but don't worry, I'm not going to be too cerebral uh, at this uh, late point of the month and of the day. But I do want to share some, uh, hopefully not too uh, random, reflections about uh, well the verse that we've just heard so so nicely recited. Fitrat Allah, alati fatra nasa alayha. God's order, God's nature, God's manner of creation, according to which He has created mankind. Uh, it's a word that we hear a lot in our religion. The religion is sometimes even called Deen al Fitra, the religion of Fitra. So I'm going to look at some definitions. What exactly is this idea of Fitra? Of fitra? How does it appear in the Quran and in the Sunnah? And why is it exactly that we like to call ourselves with this name, the religion of the fitra? Why not the religion of Tawheed or the religion of Akhlaq? And you could think of lots of things uh, which would work. But Dinal Fitra is quite a common uh, appellation. So beginning with the, uh, with the topical, I think, um, it's often helpful uh, when juxtaposing religion and modernity to begin with the uh, modern crisis. Religion is very often seen as some kind of fly in the ointment of progress, if only Muslims and other conservative religionists would up their game and conform to the standards of the dominant civilization, then everybody can march ahead arm in arm to a confident utopian future. Uh, I think more useful is to begin with some of the existential threats which modernity is confronting us with and then to see how religion might be something that could adjust modernity rather than the other way around. Heretical thought perhaps for some. Cambridge of course, the university now has a 
Center for the Study of Existential Risks. It's called something like that. Even a generation ago, that would have seemed strange. Progress seemed to be hardwired into the logic of the material world. Of course, things were going to get better, just as Darwin had thought that uh, the world's life forms migrated from simplicity to complexity, so also we would rise and rise. A kind of social Darwinism underpinned most of the ideologies of the 20th century, whether fascistic or communistic, and that uh, has left a long shadow. Now, however, we seem to be at the end of progress, looking at a world in which things at best may be expected to go sideways. And the biggest of the existential threats, I suppose, is global warming uh, and the fact that human greed and the absence of human wisdom have now uh, become so extreme that, uh, well, 75% of insects have already died, that kind of thing. And as a, uh, a historian of science, ruefully noted, if human beings became extinct, the world would recover and be in pretty good shape within a hundred years. If the insects became instinct, extinct, uh, life would never recover. It's a sobering thought. Uh, and you might have seen Dahar Jamail, the uh, Iraqi uh, quite heroic journalist, um, and his recent book, The End of Ice, which is uh, not just describing the apparent inexorability of climate change, but also looking at ways in which human beings can adapt psychologically, spiritually, economically to a world in which, as he says, there's no ice uh, and in which whole tracts of the world have become literally uninhabitable unless one is sort of using technology designed for survival on Mars. Uh, it is uh, a gloomy prospect, but I don't propose to talk about that particularly, although obviously Islam, custodian of nature, nature is fitra, comes into this. It's not Islamic civilization that has produced this enormous disequilibrium in the world's ecosystems. Um, even though we're endlessly urged to catch up, hurry up, join the carnival float of progress to the shining new future. But it's not Islamic civilization or any other civilization. It's not the Hindus, it's not the Confucians who produce this. It's something specific to Western European modernity. And the reasons for that um, needn't concern us. Uh, so Dahra Jumail's book is new and is interesting, but I want more to focus for my kind of opening setting of the scene of this Fitra debate on another book, I think even more recent. I don't know if you can see that. Countdown is probably back to front of your screens, but that shouldn't deter a Cambridge brain. Countdown, Shanna Swan, how our modern world is threatening sperm counts, altering male and female reproductive development and imperiling the future of the human race. And this Shanna Swan used to be in charge of the American government's scientific task force, which uh, sought to identify the extent and the uh, consequences of this catastrophe. Um, and uh, the declining uh, reproductive capacities of Homo sapiens is something that has been in the news anyway. And the reasons as she maps them out are complex because we are complex. Uh, there are a lot of environmental toxins. Again, we get away from Fitra, from the natural, from the organic and into this world of gray steel and uh, plastic in particular. Endocrine disrupting chemicals everywhere. Even, even though we used to think that the placenta was kind of a magic shield um, in the fetus as it develops. And this is affecting testosterone rates throughout the developing world. Libido rates, the end of the sexual revolution, it seems, um, only 30 years before it began and intensifying, she suggests, gender fluidity and a lot of the gender confusions and expansions and morphisms uh, that seem to be so central to our culture wars at the moment. Uh, the fact that uh, increasing numbers of women are now occupying traditionally male spaces uh, is also pushing down the birth rate, et cetera, et cetera. So in Singapore, a place which I like and visit um, quite often where there's a thriving Muslim community, Aid in Singapore, I can recommend, uh, by the way, as long as you don't have a, a weight problem. Uh, Singapore, uh, the average woman now has 1.1 babies. Bulgaria, only slightly more. Italy, 1.3. And the rate is nosediving everywhere. A country needs 65% of its uh, population to be of working age to be more or less manageable economically. 
but the old are proliferating and the young are not reproducing. So just to take one representative nugget from this, uh, Japan's proportion of the population that's of working age has dropped to less than 60%. In Japan, the 65 plus proportion of the population was 6% of the total in 1960 and surged to a whopping 27% in 2018. These days, there aren't enough healthcare workers to care for the elderly population and restrictive immigration laws aren't helping. Meanwhile, the birth rate is down to 1.4, sperm counts are low, fewer males are being born compared to females, as often happens in response to environmental stressors. At the same time, more women of childbearing age are putting their careers first and postponing or rejecting marriage and motherhood, uh, etc. This has supposedly given rise to celibacy syndrome, which has been described as a decline in sexual interest and activity or even romantic relationships among young adults in Japan. That's at the other end of the Eurasian uh, landmass, but um, the Greek government, as we reported last week, is now providing fat uh, multi-thousand euro bonuses to women who will take a career break and, and pop a baby or two. Now, this, of course, is an irony and an indication of the human as well as the natural imbalances uh, which modernity has prompted, because countries such as Greece where the women are no longer reproducing and the men don't particularly want to hook up with women any longer, uh, is also the scene of these catastrophic uh, waves of migration. Uh, there's camps in Lesbos, Thassos, the Peloponnese, elsewhere in Greece, the landmines that they now have to deter people trying to cross over from, from Turkey. That could be a solution, and historically that would be the solution, but the problem is, as we all know, they're culturally different, culturally unacceptable, Islamically unacceptable. So one consequence of this existential risk and crisis has been uh, that uh, Muslim identity and Muslim migration has gone right to the center of the political agenda of modern Europe. You might have seen the Danish government has just decided that it's going to deprive the Syrian refugee population in its country of the usual refugee rights and the right to settle and have abode in, in Denmark. Macron is now lurching to the right because he's terrified of a Le Pen victory. The central issue for these countries is now uh, the demographic deficit, uh, gender confusion, and the possibility of rectifying that through increased immigration, which is politically, uh, it seems, impossible. So uh, one of the imbalances that we're likely to see over the next few decades is going to be as environmental and political factors increasingly devastate Muslim countries. But America has its own issue with Latin American countries and you can see how they're piling up on the Rio Grande, it's a, an equivalent issue. That uh, there will have to be some kind of large scale uh, population management scheme just to accommodate those probably hundreds of millions of people who are trying to escape the devastated regions of uh, that particular latitudinal strip of the planet. So uh, I wanted to start by uh, doing my favorite thing of interrogating modernity by pointing out what a mess things are in and what a mess we are in, even basic definitions of masculinity, femininity, reproduction being the essential biological purpose of our species. Secular biologists would say it's the only thing we exist for Ah, we're so sophisticated that we can't even do that any longer. Well, certainly in the West, in the Muslim world, uh, they are still doing that. And in Somalia, for instance, the birth rate is over six babies per woman. And you probably saw perhaps that emblematic, uh, rather terrifying tale of the Muslim woman from Mali, who two days ago gave birth to nine babies in one batch. So not really a demographic or reproductive or a libidinous problem in the third world and particularly in the Muslim world. It's a crisis of the developed world. So that's what I wanted to start with. The fact that nature, if we're understanding fitra as something to do with nature, is in very extreme disarray and that the Muslim world for all of its other dysfunctions is at least biologically still functioning in a normative way. So 
Uh, let's get on to definitions of what we understand by this word fitra. Uh, it's one of those very many Quranic terms which translate only uncomfortably into uh, the English language. Uh, and we heard the, uh, the, the idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the fatir and that he has a fitra. So one of his names, the divine names, even though it's not in the approved Tirmidhi list of 99 beautiful names, it is one of the divine names in the Quran. Fatir as samawati wal ard, anta waliyi fi dunya wal akhira, which is Sayyidina Yusuf's beautiful dua at the end of that surah. He calls his Lord the fatir of the samawati wal ard. In other words, the originator of heaven and earth. This root, fa-ta-ra, in Arabic, has something like the sense of to open, to split, uh, to divide, uh, and has a very strongly biological sense to it. So in Surah Al-Infitar, the whole surah that takes its name from this root, when the heavens are burst asunder, not really anything to do with fitra, though, you might think, but we'll, we'll see. So. Uh, the word fatir, disputed in the early tafsir literature, although it's now quite clear what it means, Ibn Abbas, for instance, one of the great Sahabis who was a commentator on the Qur'an, says, I didn't know what fatir meant until I heard two Bedouin uh, arguing next to a well in the desert, and one of them said, Ana fatartuha. I'm the one who Fatartuha, I'm the one who opened it, created it. So that gives a good sense of the original primal, primordial Arabic sense of it being an opening in something, a cleft. So we have the related word, which is also in the Quran of Futur. If you know Surah Al Mulk, you'll remember Farji al Basara hal tara min Futur. Look at, the, direct your sight again at the perfection and the symphony of the cosmos, do you see any cleft, any breakage, any kind of, huh, we might say, singularity uh, nowadays, something like a, a black hole that opens into another universe, but this means kind of a defect rather than those extraordinary things, neutron stars and black holes and, and pulsars and other extraordinary things, which the creator has chosen to adorn the heavens with. It's not referring to that. Similarly, in Arabic, the word futar uh, means a sword that is cracked. In other words, a blade that has a cleft in it. So one way of saying that a man is a loser in Arabic is to say, well, futari, a man with a, a, a cracked sword. We might say a broken reed in English, I guess, is perhaps an analogous concept. Uh, the usual Arabic word for fungus or mushrooms is something like futar because it kind of pops up, it bursts out of sometimes quite unpromising surfaces from the soil, from, from bark, or even from rock. Uh, we also say, uh, when we break the fast, that it's fitr or iftar, because we are rupturing, as it were, breaking the fast at that time. Um, so, uh, we also say in Arabic, fatur, meaning breakfast. It's usual word for breakfast time because you're breaking something. So how does this rather complex semantic word world fit with our understanding of Islam, the religion of fitra, the religion of nature? What's the connection? What's the connection between a cleft and the beauties of nature? Well, uh, we heard the Qur'an at the beginning of the session. وَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا Direct your face to the religion as a Hanif, primordial Abrahamic monotheist. This is Allah's fitra, which he created mankind upon. So here you have the juxtaposition of the idea of fitra with the idea of creation and an ex nihilo a uh, miracle of something coming out of nothing. So creation with a big C, the, the uh, origination. So the first meaning in the Arabic language of fitra is actually creation. 
something coming into being. But because everything is that, other than the Vater, the creator himself, everything is this cleft in the normativity of non-being, this uh, strange paradox that there should be anything at all, this rupture that produces the Big Bang, those pulsars and all of that other rather extraordinary and abundant stuff under the divine name al that this is what uh, determines our place in the world as creatures, in other words, part of nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we get the idea that this is a natural disposition, that it is the right way for human beings to be, mm -hmm. the intended created form of man. So in the Hadith, we have the Holy Prophet saying to somebody, if you say this prayer, فَإِنَّكَ إِنْ مُتَّ مِنْ لَيْلَتِكَ مُتَّ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ If you say this prayer and you die tonight, you will die in the fitra. In other words, according to a primordial, natural, right, God-oriented disposition. And perhaps the most famous hadith text about fitra is the famous one that says, every child is born according to the fitra. Every child is born according to the fitra, and it's only his two parents who make of him a Jew or a Christian or a fire worshipper. So uh, then the scholars say, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that if somebody is brought up in a religion which is not the religion of Islam, that they are therefore categorically not on the fitra any longer. If fitra means the created norm of human beings, is there something profoundly wrong existentially with people who aren't saying the shahada? Well, actually, according to the sharia, a child who is brought up as a Christian is legally Christian and not Muslim. So if a baby dies, even though you could say, well, the parents haven't had any influence on the child yet, therefore the child dies on the fitra. So let's give the child a janazah and whisk him off to the Muslim cemetery. You don't do that because in Sharia, uh, the child follows uh, the default religion of the parents, which has implications for things like inheritance, for instance. So we could say that fitra is not the same as Islam but that it is a, uh, a metabolic, deep-rooted predisposition to accept Islam as the full truth. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is, follows on in the fiqh. So Imam Shafi'i says, looking at this issue of children and the fitra, um, once a parent takes Islam, the children then automatically are considered Muslims. Little kids, they don't need to do their shahada. They kind of automatically go with the parental, uh, the parental identity. So Islam, the religion of fitra, but fitra is not identical with Islam. It's a kind of predisposition in the human temperament that is that finds its fullest expression in the details of the uh, of its Islamic form. So you could say it's to do with the interior life, not with the exterior life. It's about something that is fundamental to our identity. So even though a lot of the early ulama actually argue about fitra, and Ahmed ibn Hanbal, for instance, says uh, fitra in these hadiths is to be understood as God's destiny of things. So it's predestination. But generally, uh, we find uh, it identified with uh, that human aspect of us that is consciously in keeping with our natural way of being. Uh, so some of the authors say it is the same as the mithaq of the primordial covenant. Primordial covenant, of course, is in Surah 7, which is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings all of the souls before they put into bodies in the world before conception and says to them all in this primordial assembly, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? 
And everybody says, Bala Shahidna, yes, we bear witness. So to be born according to the fitra means on this reading to be born according to the implications of that primordial covenant. In other words, uh, the child is in a natural state of reaffirming its relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we find uh, therefore that the concept of fitra is complicated. Uh, and when we say <coughs> Islam, the religion of fitra, we are talking about a specific prophetic dispensation, a form of life, a saintly disposition of our outward form that brings that outward form into harmony with our inward form. Mm -hmm. And that's why you get the hadiths that talk about certain forms of grooming being expression of fitra. <laughs> the hadith that say cutting nails, circumcision and so forth, um, uh, letting the beard grow, shortening the moustache and so forth. This is minal fitra, according to the hadith. But you might say, but that's not the way the baby is, and that's not the, the natural organic form of human beings. That's a, a modification. So if Islam is the natural way, how come that fitra also determines these things? Well, uh, the response here is, that Islam is the religion of fitra insofar as it recognizes that human beings who say, Bala shahidna, yes, we bear witness, have a particular form of arranging themselves, particularly in the Muhammadan dispensation, which is not just <coughs> the hippie approach of letting the hair grow indefinitely and not taking a shower, but which, uh, which entails certain, you might call sort of grooming practices which are also seen as part of the fitra and part of humanity. So uh, we get uh, in the famous hadiths of the Mi'raj, um, uh, a range of amazing hadiths where this word is also cited and where it seems to be there to differentiate the religion of Islam from the religions of those prophets whom, with whom the Holy Prophet has prayed in Jerusalem and who he is now, as it were, transcending. So famously in some of the hadith, uh, the angel offers the Holy Prophet near the summit of his ascent, two chalices, one of milk and one of wine. And he rejects the wine and chooses the milk. And the angel says to him, Hudita lil fitra you have been guided to the fitra. Uh, and this is said to be uh, a sign that because the Holy Prophet's inclination is towards that which is natural rather than that which is in the context of alcohol, fermented and denatured as it were, taken by human hands away from its natural form, an indication uh, that the Holy Prophet represents a kind of retrieval of primordiality. And this is why we have this association of the Mi'raj with this intercession, which you find in a lot of our devotional poetry. Uh, <coughs> and his intercession is to be universal. He is the supreme intercessor who enacts a Shafa'at al-Kubra, all of those hadiths which have people going from prophet to prophet on the day of judgment. And the Holy Prophet is the one whose intercession is universal and is to be accepted. So, uh, it is uh, therefore to do with the ruhi aspect of humanity, which is manifested and articulated in the mind, body, spirit synergy most perfectly in the person of the Holy Prophet والسلام, and supremely at the summit of the Mi'raj, the highest point of the, <coughs> the Khilafa. So, uh, in some of the Sufi literature, we find that the term is also uh, developed, uh, reflecting <coughs> the immutability of the ruh. Sufism is big on overcoming the ego and liberating and returning to our true identity, which is the ruh, that which said, Bala shahidna, yes, we are bear witness. 
Uh, and so Ibn Arabi in his Futuhat says this, for instance, when Allah created the Ruh, he created it perfect, fully developed, rational, aware, having faith in Tawheed, admitting his Lordship. This is the fitra according to which he created mankind. In other words, fitra is uh, to be abd, the fullness of saying bala shahidna, to be slave, which is the nature of the glory of the Holy Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, and in submission to which state we get the name of the religion, Islam, fitra means to be abd, to be slave. This is very beautifully expressed, by the way, in this book um, by Claude Ardas, the French Muslim writer, which is quite recent. La maison mohammedienne aperçue de la dévotion au prophète au mystique musulman. The Mohammedan house insights into devotion to the prophet in Islamic mysticism, which has a, quite a good session section on uh, Ibn Arabi and his understanding of uh, human obodiya as being the true meaning of fitrah. We are created to be Allah's slaves and worshippers. Uh, and this is why, uh, whereas some ulama think that the fitra of human beings, uh, which they take to be our deep-seated temperament, can be changed, Ibn Arabi says it's immutable in every human. The fitra can't be changed. It's such a deep substrate of our uh, of our nature that it's beyond the reach of any kind of reform or damage. There's no altering the creation of Allah. So, and in the medical tradition as well, you find fitra used uh, almost synonymous with tabi'a. So it's something in which the humors have to be balanced. And uh, this is just a reminder of the fact that this, this, this term is very multiply used in our civilization. It's not a, it's not a theological technical term, nor a technical term really in Sufism, apart from Ibn Arabi's sense that it just means be, being an, an abd. So, uh, uh, that hopefully has shed some light on what the tradition means by fitra, in other words, our created nature, uh, and the fact that we enter the world fully with this nature, and it is never in its essence taken away from us, which is one reason why the Fuqahat speak of Ismat al Adamiya that human beings are all uh, sacrosanct. So the basic human prohibitions on adultery and murder and so forth uh, aren't just for Muslims, but they apply to, to everybody. Um, it's never permissible just randomly to, to kill people and to, to violate marriage bounds. So there's certain things that are universal. Why? Because everybody has that deep entitlement to be considered hu human even though their religions may be in conflict with each other and some of them may not make sense, but they have this, this basic principle, this asl in Islamic law is, is the universal recognition of, of our Adamic uh, togetherness. So that's fitra. And then I also wanted to talk about the Ramadan moon. What on earth is the connection? Well, if fitra indicates Islam's valor, valorization of nature, uh, so also does Islam's frequent appropriation of the moon. The moon belongs to us, whatever Elon Musk might think uh, we got there first, uh, because we use it as the basis for so much of our calendar, of our ibadah, and uh, also of our symbolism. The most common symbol for the religion, at least since about the 14th century, has been the uh, the uh, uh, crescent and star. Now, <coughs> um, I could talk a lot about the stars, but it is interesting that the most common form of the star, which is used in Islamic geometry, and Islamic geometry, like Islamic art generally, is there in order to remind us of the essential order in things, that despite the apparent chaos of the surface of matter, everything beneath the surface is subject to extraordinary physical constants and tends to order itself 
uh, in regular ways. Um, so the star, and particularly Islam has favored the eight pointed star. That's the most common form, uh, any geometrical form in Islamic art. And you get it in Sumatra, you get it in Morocco, the Alhambra, the Taj Mahal. We love the eight pointed star. It's all over the new Cambridge mosque, for instance. And Keith Critchlow, who was the geometer who designed the symbolism of the, the building, knew exactly what it was. In, in our civilization, it's always called Najmat al Quds um, because the eight pointed star is emblematic of the ground plan of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, which is where the Mi'raj happened, a sort of celestial moment. Uh, in ancient civilizations, the eight-pointed star was always linked with, and I got this from the Hutchinson Dictionary Series, linked with creation, fertility, and sex, the symbol of the ancient Babylonian goddess Ishtar, the symbol of Venus as the evening star, and particularly octograms of overlapping squares, which is the more Islamic version of it, two squares, but at 45 degrees to each other, uh, represents just about in every sacred civilization uh, the coming together of dualities, the yin and the yang in our civilization, heaven and earth, Jamal and Jalal, uh, Jalal uh, male and female, uh, the, the binaries that the Quran proposes as being the basic dynamic for fitra, for, for creation, for creative reality. So there too, we get uh, the Islamic symbolism and the basis of Islamic geometry being very strong about two things, about uh, the integration of transcendence and immanence, but also about the principle of life, It is a kind of fertility symbol. And again, that takes us back to my, my vain hope that the hearts of European politicians will melt and they'll see that the only demographic hope for their countries is to let in all of those Boat people. But anyway, Islam, religion of life. Uh, Abu Radu Chalabi has a nice book by that title. The idea that this is particularly the religion of biophilia. Um, and we might, if we have time, talk a little bit more about what the Quran says about life <coughs> um, towards the end of this presentation. But finally, to the moon, uh, which is there in, of course, on top of most minarets. Uh, and is the basis of timekeeping for <coughs> really ancient communities. Ancient man knew that the, uh, the moon orbits the earth once every um, 29.5 something days. This is called the synodical lunar month. And for primordial human beings, that's the most obvious basic division of time, more obvious even than the week. But because the moon's orbit is tilted at five degrees to the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun, the moon's movements are really complicated. And that's why we have these issues about moon sighting. I don't think that even the, the diverse and disputatious modern Ummah has argued about sun sighting. <laughs> Um, we're not there yet, but moon sighting, yes, it's one of the things of what's going to happen next week in Cambridge. It's because the moon is identified as this subtle, indirect, unpredictable feminine principle, whereas the, the sun, soul, is always identified with masculine linearity. There's a stereotype there, I take it or leave it. But uh, it, for primordial human beings, it affects the tides, it affects biorhythms, particularly, but not exclusively for women so it was an obvious basis for human life and traditional ritual and cultic behavior was very often geared to the moon and its phases <coughs> of course other civilizations uh, found this untidy the romans who had tidy minds tried to add days to the ends of some months to kind of equal it out to make it uh, more like the solar year and that's the basis of the system that we have now which is not ideal because the solar year is actually 365.26 something days it's not tidy either the chinese some other cultures added an extra month the 13th month intercalatory month um, which is actually forbidden in the quran because it was one of the practices of the jahiliya in the man nasi or ziyadatun fil kufr 
the intercalatory month is an increase or an excess of unbelief. The reason being that this is an attempt to kind of correct the solar system, which is God's creation and that there was a wisdom and a natural <coughs> biorhythmic synergy with human beings in the lunar month. So uh, to alter it is the same as preferring wine over milk, if you like. <coughs> the ancient Chinese, great. Practical people tried to have it both ways by having two calendars. They had a solar calendar, which was for agriculture, uh, but they also had a lunar calendar, which was for religion. Again, this idea that a sacred calendar should be governed by the moon. Um, so uh, the moon, which actually governs our calendar uh, and which reminds us that the forms of Muslim ritual and life are very primordial, pre-axial and fitri, because it's the solar system that really determines our devotional patterns, the five daily prayers and the, uh, the months, the hajj. This is all to do with the solar system in a very primordial way. No intercalation. Uh, and there's arguments about whether you can have a pre-calculated calendar for Muslims. Uh, I don't think that that's really going to catch on, even though the Turks do it. <coughs> in any case, the final thing I wanted to talk about to bring these things together is the idea that Ramadan obviously reconnects us in many ways to very ancient forms of human life and behavior um, where there weren't clocks of any kind, but only the movements of the sun and the moon. We don't have seasonal festivals in Islam, which is interesting and seems to set us apart from many of those primordial cultures where they had sort of harvest festivals and uh, winter rituals and so forth. And the reason for this is said to be that the divine wisdom knew that Islam would spread in both hemispheres um, and there's nothing more ridiculous than a white Christmas celebration in Australia, for instance. I was once on Bondi Beach on Christmas Day. <laughs> there was Santa. Uh, it was a really hot day. Santa was there in his fur and his hood and so forth, looking extremely uncomfortable. Uh, so it, it, the interpretation of our not having seasonal festivals is that it's because of the, the universality and the the summative nature, the khatmiya of Islam. Uh, so that's an aspect of primordiality uh, that we don't have in uh, the formal uh, structures of our religion. But the Quran itself uh, is emphatically a book of nature uh, in many respects. And if you look at some of the modern uh, books on Islam and the environment. Uh, Fazl and Khalid's book is quite good on this. And also Reza Shah Kazami has an essay which is on this Islamic mosque website, um, which is um, pretty nice. The Quran is, unlike, say, the New Testament, absolutely jam packed with invocations of nature. Nature as signs, uh, yet. So uh, the ulama speak of there being two registers of revelation for the believer. There is Al-Qur'an al-Tadwini, which is the written Qur'an. There is also Al-Qur'an al-Takwini, which is the creation Qur'an. In other words, the whole world is a book which we can read, and the word ayah is used for the verses or the elements of both. <laughs> the Qur'an also, in an almost animistic way, insists that everything in creation in this fitra is in a state of adoration. And this again is not anything that the New Testament authors uh, could have related to. In min shay'in illa yusab biho bihamdihi, there's nothing which does not glorify Allah's praise, which is in Surah Al Isra. Mm -hmm. And this idea of the whole cosmos as engaged in some kind of symphonic praise for the divine is one of the ways in which we can understand this expression of Islam as Deen al-Fitra, the religion of the primordial natural disposition, because part of what is natural and innate in human beings is a recognition 
that nature is not just a set of objects, but nature is indicative in ways that to poets and musicians, novelists have always been vaguely, but very intensely perceived. That there is something in the natural world, what the enlightenment writers sometimes call the sublime, that you stand on top of the mountain in the Bavarian Alps, and you're not just contemplating upon geology, but the heart is also active in ways that uh, are difficult really to put into words. And you could say culture originates with this amazement of about nature, the earliest cave paintings or whatever. Uh, so there's a strongly aestheticizing dimension to the Quranic text, uh, but also this animating of the world with uh, some kind of capacity that things have to praise their creator. And we even have in the sound hadith, mysterious episodes, such as that where the Holy Prophet والسلام, is upon Mount Thabir in Mecca, uh, uh, with uh, the first three Khulafa, Abu Bakr and Omar and Othman. And they are remembering God together. And then the mountain starts to shake. It's like an earthquake until, according to the hadith, the pebbles start rattling down. The Holy Prophet stamps on the mountain and says, Eskin Thabir, be still Thabir because there's nothing upon you except Nabiyun wa Siddiqun wa Shahidan, a prophet, a truth-telling one, Abu Bakr, and two martyrs. What does that possibly mean? That their spiritual presence causes some kind of oscillation in space and time? Well, here we are in the realm of the miraculous. Uh, even more strange, the Tasbih al-Hasa, where the Holy Prophet والسلام, is able to pick up a handful of pebbles, show them to his companions, and miraculously they're able to hear them praising God. What exactly was that experience? It must have been pretty amazing. Uh, and the prophetic story of Suleiman and his capacity to speak to the birds, the ants, and so forth. It is a charism of prophecy and quite often attributed also to some of the saints of Islam. It's almost a standard feature in prophetic stories and Bahad in Naqshband, famously part of his spiritual training was that uh, his teacher Amir Kolal uh, required him for seven years to serve the street dogs of Bukhara who were generally neglected. And uh, it's at the point where he heard a dog that was ill with a skin disease, crying out or yelping, uh, that uh, Bahadi Nakhban understood what the dog was saying and achieved his enlightenment. Lots and lots of stories in our hagiography about this, which are quite distinctively Islamic. So I should um, come to a close shortly, but uh, what I have said is, about, about the moon and the fitra uh, is in a sense quite obvious and merely a restatement of what we generally as Muslims already know, which is that uh, self-transcendence, the basic spiritual purpose of human beings, is not the same as the repudiation of nature. We've never had strict traditions of monasticism, celibacy and so forth, mortification of a type that in Christianity and many forms of Buddhism were pretty normative. And this is because of the golden mean, which is part of the fitra, that there is an appropriate partaking of life in the world, which is characteristically uh, Islamic. And this is, of course, the prayer which concludes uh, the Fatiha, which is a prayer to be in the middle way, not those on whom there is wrath, nor those who have gone astray, the two earlier ummas who strayed into opposite directions and Islam is reparative and restores the balance. So 
what we have with the Khatmiya of Islam then is a very clear retrieval of primordiality. That in the basic forms of the religion and in the key aspects of Muslim social life, we have something that seems to close the great cycle of revelation by taking us back to a really ancient time of which the Kaaba, of course, and the Black Stone are indications. The Black Stone is about the primordial covenant. Islamic art, with its aniconism, its reluctance to believe that uh, you can do things at the highest level just with the human face, rather than with the order that lies beneath the surface of things, uh, again takes us back to very ancient forms of decoration, the uh, Australian Aboriginals perhaps, certain Neolithic forms of art, but of course very strictly regimented in order to draw out the symmetries of the, the created and the natural world. And the movements of the solar system, which trace themselves a beautiful arabesque, this is precisely the absence of futur, there's no cleft, there's no kind of randomness, nothing unexpected in their movements. It's a great uh, orrery, a great moving sphere that is, again, uh, chanting the creator's praise. The Muslim life is part of that. So entering Islam is to re-enter a truly fitri lifestyle, to notice the phases of the moon again, which most people neither know nor care about, to know when the sun rises and sets. And Ramadan, of course, which is a very, very primordial, ancient kind of human practice, because just about every civilization, with the exception to some extent of some forms of Eastern Buddhism, Japanese Buddhism, for instance, doesn't do much with fasting, except in a kind of penitential way. <clears throat> it's pretty universal. So in our age where everything is unnatural and anti-natural, we are biophiliac. We insist on our understanding of human beings as needing ritual, as needing a clear understanding of gender, of being part of the natural world, and this being uh, tasbih, and therefore celebration, because there's no tasbih that is not celebratory. The recognition of the divine in the world and in each other is necessarily the recognition of what is beautiful and perfect. So in tasbih and in hamd, which is the work of all creation, we find we find joy, and this is the sa'ada, which is necessarily part of um, being part of the ummah of Islam. So that's essentially what I wanted to say, and probably I've spoken about too many disparate subjects, but I hope that uh, my drift has been clear, that Ramadan is an opportunity to recenter ourselves, to recall our biological natures, and to be reintegrated into the anciently axiomatic movements of the solar system and into ancient human patterns of behavior in a way that modernity really will not be able to accomplish. More modernity probably means more dysfunction because uh, knowledge is increasing, wisdom isn't increasing, and that's an extremely ominous and dangerous source of these existential risks. So that's essentially what I wanted to say, uh, and I believe that there is the possibility of uh, Q&A, should there be any people who have uh, not nodded off in this Ramadan afternoon and would like to uh, suggest some corrections or some uh, some some questions, I'm I'm up for it. I have I have time. Yeah, so. um, people have been submitting anonymously throughout the talk. Uh, so the first question is: Are there similarities between the critique of modernity and Ibn Khaldun's theory on the cycle of civilization? and the idea of decay and decline due to luxury as being in Western Europe? Well, in a sense, but you have to remember that Ibn Khaldun, as has been pointed out by a lot of uh, analysts, uh, was writing not even for the whole Ummah, but for his specific experience of North Africa, where it was the case that <coughs> city dwellers would go soft and then they'd be overcome by puritanical nomad movements from the countryside and then after a few generations they'd get soft as well and that seemed to be an obvious way to to look at things <coughs> looking at the larger pattern of human history of course because human beings are complex and the uh, geographical climatic civilizational spheres which they occupy very different um, 
we generally see time in linear terms rather than the cyclical terms which are favored for instance by uh, by hinduism and buddhism uh, we believe in a creation in time and a movement towards an end of time so it's linear but within that of course nature itself is made up of cycles human life is a cycle from babyhood to decrepitude and that's certainly incorporated in our tradition uh, ibn khaldun i think probably wouldn't have envisaged the fact that the predicted environmental tumult of the last days which is predicted in the Quran as well as in the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible, would have been so evidently the consequence of human acts and human cupidity. <coughs> I don't think he really expected that because the prospect of the entire natural world being subverted by human beings, us weak puny human beings would have been unimaginable in the traditional world and even a generation ago people couldn't quite believe that we might all die as a result of uh, improper economic models it, it, it's it's part of our modernity part of our tension the the second question is how does fitra relate to an argument for the proof of the existence of god an argument for the existence of god <laughs> well we have arguments in our civilization uh, some of them are ratiocinative and the uh, famous uh, Kalam argument from contingency is a one that's gone into modern philosophy of religion is still being elaborated. Uh, and there are also arguments in Kalam that were known to the medievals, but that because the Ummah has generally moved away from sort of philosophical theology in the direction of sort of hadith and fiqh and fatwa things in the last hundred years or so, have been neglected. And there's a lot of books that really are still sitting in manuscripts. We don't know what's up there. But there's also the Ghazalian turn, which holds that essentially what the human identity of abd constitutes is this fitra and therefore it's human nature to <coughs> to believe he says min fadlillahi ala al-insan and sharaha sadrahu lil iman min ghayri hajatin ila hujatin aw burhan one of god's blessings upon mankind is that he has naturally opened his heart to faith <coughs> even without needing some kind of proof or argument. Of course, in his Kalam works, Imam Ghazali did develop complex proofs and arguments, but uh, the natural state of human beings, fitra, is to believe. Children have a natural uh, instinct and sense that, of course, the world couldn't just have popped out of primordial nothingness. The nothingness that even nothingness is a concept and a thing and something that isn't even nothingness and then produced in the first few microseconds after the Big Bang, this incredible panoply of physical constants and laws and the majesty of creation, let alone life and then human moral life, aesthetics, <laughs> Shakespeare, Hafiz and so forth, that that's such a preposterous idea that it's only a deep spiritual sickness and a egotistic rebellion, a waywardness that could possibly entertain such a thing. It's profoundly stupid. Um, children can see that. They can see the silliness of unbelief because, well, even a, a doggy in the street is amazing to the child and he wants mummy to look and wants everybody to look because they have a healthy sense of the inherent uh, improbability of things, which in our jaded adulthood we tend to forget. But the Quran is asking us to, to reassert that and asking us to look again at creation with, uh, with a sound heart, with a lub, and to intuit not to rationalize but to intuit the intrinsic dependent uh, dependency and amazingness of things so yeah fitra is is part of that which naturally generates a sound faith a secure awareness that things have a source just a couple more inshallah uh, the next one is if people can determine that murder is wrong through fitra then why is it that people who have not been reached by the message of Islam are saved? Uh, people who have not been reached by the message, according to the Ashari position, and the scholars take different views. And if you look at Ibn Arabi, whose views on universal salvation are, from the point of view of orthodoxy, a little bit on the edge, because he says everybody ultimately will be saved because the fitra is there in 
everybody's substrate, even if people go to hell for a while, they'll all end up in a state of infernal felicity. Um, but whereas the Sunni position has held that uh, the Ahl al-Fatra, people who are unreached, are not necessarily saved. Uh, but to the extent that through their culture or through their intuition and their intelligence, they know the unity uh, and the justice of God, uh, then they can be saved. So uh, and then their ruling, Abu Qahir of Baghdadi says, is hukmuhum ka hukmil muslimin. So somebody who's brought up on a desert island, the kind of Haib al scenario, uh, who doesn't have access to a revealed book, through his fitra should be able to work out at least the outlines of monotheism and the moral life uh, to the extent that that person can be judged. And that's one of the differences between the Ashari and the Maturidi position on this, because uh, uh, the Ashari say that it's possible for people to know those things uh, without access to a specific revelation. The Maturidi say it's absolutely obligatory for everybody to know God, irrespective of you know, their culture or where they happen to be. It's one of the key arguments between the two main Sunni schools. Next is, uh, if, as Ibn Arabi claims, fitra is not changeable nor corruptible, then how come modernity is deforming and deconstructing it? Well, because uh, there is also the possibility of asfila safilin, that we, if we follow nefs and not ruh, and we follow our appetite in an aberrant way, not a normative way, then we end up damaging ourselves, damaging our spiritual capacities, damaging our, as we can see, even our reproductive capacities now, which is quite extreme, damaging the whole world. Um, so this is part of the Zulzilatil uh, Ardo Zilzalaha. It's about human greed leading to massive convulsions in the state of the planet. And the front principal function of human beings nowadays seems to be not what human beings used to do, which was to have a religion and to have a neighborhood and to have babies. And, uh, but instead, it's this enormous consumer world, an entertainment world, where the principal function of human beings in this what's called the Anthropocene age is to damage the earth by digging things up and then making them into things that we throw away pretty quickly and then burying them in more holes in the ground. And that's what human beings are doing. That's our principal activity. Anybody from a visiting starship looking at and uh, saying, well, that's what they care about. That's what they're doing. And they love it so much that it's really difficult for them to make sacrifices to try and deal even with an existential threat such as climate change. So that's human beings who are really perverted, taken away from the fitra. So the Quran says, uh, we created man fi asini taqwim in the best of forms. The true human being, the true man, the true woman is an incredibly noble being with the capacity for moral knowledge, sacrifice, fasting, worship, um, uh, courtesy, uh, cultural production. Extraordinary. It's nothing like Bunny Adam in any of the galaxies that we know of. We've never found anything outside this planet and there's nothing on this planet more amazing than human beings. Um, but uh, then we pushed him down to be the lowest of the low because of our power, nafs, ego, it's a basic spiritual, not even a Sufi lesson, it's just the obvious teaching of all religions, which is that left our own devices, we succumb to the force of gravity. Um, and something like Ramadan really helps us to recognize that the, the day in Ramadan, if you have some degree of self-possession and discipline, you can have a really good day and feel pleased with yourself at the end of the day of having got stuff done. If you just give way to your sloth and your grumbles and you don't do very much, then yeah, you've been pulled down. So Ramadan's a kind of microcosm of that big life lesson. I think you've touched on some of this already, uh, but one final question. How would you recommend we return back to our fitra? And what was the dua you mentioned um, that if you recite it, before you sleep, you'll die in a state of fitra. Um, not sure what the, the du'a was, unless it was the beautiful final peroration of Sayyidina Yusuf, where he talks about um, Allah being wali fi dunya wal akhirah, 
my protecting friend in this world and the next. But what we can do to return to the fitra, well, I would say that's exactly and entirely what Islam does. That it is the khatam al adiyan the seal of the religions, precisely designed to have forms and timetables and attitudes and ways of looking at the world that reconnect us to what is primordially human in an age which the divine wisdom knew would be an age of profound disconnection and alienation from, from nature and from our bodies and each other and ourselves. So in the sociality of Islam, in the rules of Islam, in the rituals of Islam, in the basic joy-seeking capacity of the believer to see the divine glow in everything, you have uh, the divinely intended pattern for returning to the fitra. And that's what we mean when we say Islam is the religion of the fitra. It's the way to relive it, to assert it in your own life. That The Muslims alone, I think, look at the sunset and do something about it. Everybody else, even if they know when the sunset is and electricity has kind of vanished, that it doesn't mean anything. But as with primordial human beings, we actually mark these things. And that, that is, enables us to return to something that I believe is profoundly normal, that form of life to which human beings have adapted over tens of thousands of years, which is a primordial, not a modern lifestyle. Great, Jazakallah khair. Um, just before we finish, I just want to say thank you, may Allah reward you, Sheikh, for giving up your time for ISOP. Um, and I'm sure we, I speak for all of us when I say we're so immensely blessed that this town that we study in is also the spiritual hub. Um, and that's largely because of your work. So to have access to spiritual teachers of your calibre as well, I certainly don't take it for granted, alhamdulillah. So may this, um, may Allah make this gathering a source of ajr to you and to all those who attended as well. May he continue to put barakah in your work to guide us and enable us to tread the same path of God consciousness and beneficial knowledge. Um, and with that, we'll, we'll wrap up. So assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.